I'm an ophthalmologist, not a health economist, and so um, uh, I've been involved with studies that have involved cost effectiveness, um, but um, I have a basic knowledge of health economy, um, and therefore uh, t too many difficult questions on health economist um, might be difficult for me. Um, so um, I was involved in um, the early study um, in 1998. Um, we, um, myself and David Owens in Wales, very keen to start a digital screening program. And um, we agreed to start on the same day so that it wasn't um, England ahead of Wales and Wales ahead of England. And so we started our screening program in 1998. And my interest was in demonstrating that digital photography was actually effective at that time because they were very early digital cameras uh, with the Sony 3-chip cameras, and the resolution was only 768 by 568. So as a result, I went out and examined um, 1,549 patients on 136 visits to primary care, um, and my result was considered to be the reference standard until the research body questioned whether I was a competent re reference standard or not. And so I was then sent to Oxford to um, be tested against seven field stereo photography on another group of 265 patients. Um, we did demonstrate that the um, digital photography did detect um, site threatening retinopathy, but we also did the costs at the time, and the costs effectively were about £18 per screen. Um, and the cost per true, true positive was £429. Um, and um, this was um, slightly more than the opportunistic screening, but then the opportunistic screening was not really detecting site-threatening retinopathy. Um, in our first round of screening, our screeners were very new, and they only screened about 13 or 14 pa patients a day, and it was also shown that the um, costs were very dependent on the um, actual throughput of patients so if one increased the throughput, one could make the um, system a lot more cost effective. Of course, that's what we've done over the years. Our throughput has gone up to nearly 30 patients uh, a day. And um, then we've then been in a situation where we've been screening for about 15 years. And then you have to say, is it still cost effective to screen every year? When um, you do your first round of screening, you pick up quite a lot of site-threatening retinopathy. But after 15 years of annual screening, the amount of site-threatening retinopathy in the population is much less, so all you're picking up is the incident site-threatening rather than anything that's prevalent. Um, and so we looked then at our group after 15 years, and we divided them in Gloucestershire, where my screening program is, into um, an incident group and a validation group. Um, so there was a group for the model building and, and a group for validation. And we looked at the um, cost effectiveness of this, at this time, and we managed to, um, we don't routinely manage to link all the risk factor data to images in the UK. Um, it's disappointing for us, but um, it's not easy to, we can get hemoglobin A1Cs, but a lot of the primary care results we don't get routinely sent through to the screening program, like the blood pressure, um, and uh, the duration of diabetes isn't particularly well collected. Um, anyway, we did manage to find that we could pick out a group that was very much at risk. You can see the group in the red line, and groups that were at much lower risk of progressing. So um, the at-risk group could be defined either by um, two screening episodes plus the clinical results, like the hemoglobin A1C and the duration of diabetes, or it could be a clinical episode plus one screening result, or it could be the previous two screening results. So all of our patients had had three screening results, and so we were looking at these um, different factors in this population. But um, from the statistical point of view, they talk about the area under the curve, which is the AUK, and the 95% confidence intervals of the area under the curve. And the results for all of these three different scenarios were very similar. And so it was felt it wasn't a huge difference as to whether you got the clinical results in or not in this population. We then looked at the hazard ratios 
And the hazard ratio for progression, the biggest one was what was in the um, previous screening result. If people had had a mild non-proliferative retinopathy in both eyes in the previous screening result, that was by far and away the greatest risk factor for progression. Risk, um, mild non-proliferative in one eye was the next greatest risk factor. Um, duration, sorry, hemoglobin A1C was the next. Then duration of diabetes, even though the data was not all that well collected, there was enough accuracy to be able to determine that. And the serum cholesterol came in for the um, maculopathy, um, uh, the, the two-dimensional markers for maculopathy. You were more likely to be screen positive for maculopathy if you had a high serum cholesterol. And we did validate these in two other data sets, one in South London screening program based at Guy's Hospital and the other in the Nottingham screening program. And these screening programs have much higher ethnic minority groups than we do in Gloucestershire. We then had the health economists in Oxford look at the um, costs of the screening program, having been doing it for 15 years, and having introduced all the quality assurance aspects of the program, like um, double grading of any image with any retinopathy. Um, and um, I think we um, double grade 10% of those with, re with retinopathy without any retinopathy. Anyway, the cost of the screening now is around £32 per screen per patient. And they considered that for the low-risk low groups, screening every um, three years would be cost-effective at the cost of 30000 per quality assurance life year threshold, which is the threshold that's used by NICE, the Nas National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK. They always go according to this um, 30,000 per quaily threshold. And for the medium to high risk group, they said that one could screen every two years safely. But we um, didn't feel that that fitted in particularly well with our patient um, all the information that we'd previously given to patients about coming to be screened annually. And so we've um, made a decision in the UK that if you have two negative screen, sorry, in England, if you have two negative screening episodes, that one can then extend the screening for two years. And I think that um, Wales and Scotland are planning on doing the same thing as well. Um, the other um, aspect that we have is um, the markers for maculopathy um, refer in quite a large number of people who actually don't have much in the way of fluid in the macular area. And although I've never felt that it would be cost effective to use um, a, an ACT, ocular coherence tomography machine, as a primary screening tool, we felt that it may be beneficial as a second line screening for those who are screen positive for diabetic maculopathy using the two dimensional markers. And so we've been doing a study um, looking at um, patients were always referred directly into the hospital eye service if they had two dimensional signs. And the alternative is to send them to a clinic where they have a, a photograph and they have an OCT. And if you actually pick out those patients who've got significant fluid in the macular area, we only need to send 20% of them on into the hospital eye service. We can keep 60% in a clinic where we will repeat the OCTs at intervals, and about 17% can be sent back to screening because um, they're no longer screen positive, perhaps because their vision has improved, because they've brought the correct spectacles with them or something like that. Um, now, obviously, this only works in a national health system like in the UK, where um, one uh, there's no there's no financial benefit to the ophthalmologists in seeing the patients. In a private setup, everybody w one would want to see all of these patients. But in the UK, we're considering this second line of screening at the present time for screen positive maculopathy. And we have actually shown that this is um, cost-effective to do. It's more cost-effective than sending the patients into the hospital. And we've just um, submitted a paper to a journal with all the analyses for that cost-effectiveness. Um, 
I thought I'd put this in, these other slides in. This was a study that we did um, demonstrating that um, in um, the UK, we looked at 2,125 children at their first screen at the age of 12, which is the age at which we first screen. And we didn't find any sight-threatening retinopathy in any of them. We did find um, mild non-proliferative retinopathy in some children at the age of 12. And by far and away, the highest percentage were those children who developed diabetes under the age of 2. So I think there was about 11% of children under, who developed diabetes under the age of 2 who had mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy in both eyes at the age of 12, and about 9% had it just in one eye. But that's... Um, uh, so if one is just purely looking for sight-threatening retinopathy, then actually starting screening at the age of 12 is probably the correct level. Um, now, if one's looking for mild non-proliferative retinopathy and one's going to alter one's management if one detects it, then it may be that the paediatricians would want photography earlier. We also looked at the older age group um, to see if there was an age at which we could stop screening, but it was very difficult to determine that because even the 75 and older um, had significant retinopathy. I think what we don't know yet is whether if we did two negative screenings in the 70s, how long could we leave it? But then, of course, with some people living to over 100 nowadays, it's very difficult to say that you can stop screening at a certain age. Um, this study looked at um, risk of sight-threatening retinopathy when there was a delay in diabetic retinopathy screening. And in all of these screening programs, um, the people who delayed diabetic retinopathy screening the most were the most likely to get sight-threatening retinopathy. And the people who were least likely to attend were the age group um, between 18 and 34. And this is the group that we have the most difficulty engaging with in the screening program, both in England and I'm sure in Wales. When we were looking at um, uh, reasons for poor uptake, um, we found that there were certain primary care reasons where if the primary care uh, doctors were engaged and the primary care nurses, we got people attending much more easily than if there was a lack of engagement in primary care. We also found that with the younger age group, in the sort of group we were talking about, 17 to 29 and younger than that, if we sent them a fixed appointment on a Saturday, they were more likely to attend than if they got either an invite to phone up or if we sent them a, an appointment during the week. And we also found this difference between do you invite the patient to phone up or do you um, send them a fixed appointment. We also found in our ethnic minority groups in England who didn't speak very good English, they're often quite reluctant to phone up, so they prefer a fixed appointment. Um, and we did do this um, one week in a group in Gloucester, um, a group of patients in Gloucester who came from an Asian background, and we were expecting um, a 10% uptake because that was the uptake from that group normally, and we sent them fixed appointments, and we got about a 40% uptake, but we didn't just get a 40% up pe people turning up, we also had all the families arrive as well. And so we were absolutely full um, in our clinic space, and we had to get a lot of extra screeners to come and help. So um, in conclusion, the key factors for a cost-effective screening program are that you, ha you need to have an inexpensive test. So I don't think, for example, that using OCT in, as a first line of screening would ever be cost effective because of the cost of the machines. So the test needs to be inexpensive. Um, it has to have a high sensitivity and specificity so that you're detecting a high proportion of the patients and you're not over-referring. Um, you have to make the population understand what it's all about and provide a friendly and professional service so that you get a high attendance rate and that they realize you're just screening for the one disease and that it's not, it doesn't replace a full eye examination. It's critical to get this high population coverage because the people most at risk are the ones who um, are less likely to attend and you have to have an ex the accessibility of an affordable treatment. So really the key message 
is that it is possible to provide a cost-effective screening program and it is possible to reduce blindness by having this pathway that links between early detection and effective treatment. In England and Wales, we've knocked it off as the leading cause of blindness in the working age group. Thank you very much.